We're better. Spring break is on the cusp. It's on the doorstep. All right. Life's good. We like all this. We got white coat coming up here in about 15 days. All right. So what I wanted to cover today, I understand and I appreciate guys flexibility last week. Um, I was in Washington, D.C. because I've become a captain site reviewer. So I was at training, um, literally doing interviews with programs and not necessarily finding out all their flaws, but finding out more about them. Um, so obviously I covered the medical screening and imaging of the hip fairly quickly over that PowerPoint. I wanted to dig in today a little bit more into hip pathology to really make sure you guys understand it. And then the other thing is I want to do a little review on MRI because MRI stood out to me on the midterm as something that was a sticking point. So I just want to make sure you guys really understand MRI because going forward, MRI is not going away, right? There's still going to be some MRI questions on the next midterm and obviously the final exam as well. So when it comes to hip pathology, this is really important because we're going to see a lot of patients and we're going to see a lot of patients with hip fractures, right? In fact, there's about a thousand patients a day in the U.S. that have a hip fracture. So this is going to be a big part of your clinical practice, inpatient, outpatient, sniff, a lot of different settings, all right? So no matter where you work, this one's not going away. You're not going to go away from this one. Big thing to understand is what the difference is between an intracapsular fracture and an extracapsular fracture. Right, so what I want you to do is kind of blend this on to your MSK stuff, blend this all the way back to anatomy last year, and understand why an intracapsular fracture is so important. The reason that an intracapsular fracture is so important is because, think about that negative pressure that happens at the femoral acetabular joint because of the capsule, and think about how that capsule literally suctions itself to the femoral neck and the femoral head. What that creates is that creates when that capsule has not been broken, but the blood vessels intracapsularly have been broken, it creates a situation where I can't get any new blood in, if that makes sense. So even though we have a very small anastomosis system in the hip and inside the capsule, it's not going to be enough to undo the damage. So if I see that my patient has a femoral head fracture, a femoral neck fracture, and I am providing them with rehab services, I need to be very, very aware, and I need to be very acutely aware that the signs and symptoms of something like avascular necrosis may happen. The reason that I want you guys to really be aware of this and I want you to have very com good communication with your PTAs. I want you to have very com good communication with your techs, with everybody in the office, because here's what's going to happen. You're going to evalu evaluate that person on a Monday. <clears throat> They're going to come in. Yeah, I fractured my hip. It's no, it's you know, no good, whatever. They got a little bit of range. They got a little bit of strength. They're appropriate for rehab. No big deal. On Friday, they come in. Yeah, it's a little sore, but, you know, I still think I can do rehab, no big deal. They, they come in the next Monday. They're on the PTA schedule. PTA says, okay, let's go ahead and put you on the new step. Let's put you on the bike, whatever it is. And that person can't even bear weight on their hip. They can't bear weight on the lower extremity. And the reason is because it's going to take 7 to 10 days or longer for that bone to start dying. And that's really important to remember because you're, when the patient has that hip fracture, that bone is still viable. It's still alive. Losing the blood supply is going to cause that bone because it is so avascular to begin with. It's going to die over a long period of time, such as a couple of weeks. And this becomes a big issue because that's right in that wheelhouse where you think the patient's okay. And the PTA thinks the patient's okay, and all of a sudden we've got avascular necrosis on our hands. The other thing is be very, very aware of things like extracapsular fractures as well. 
Now, with an extra capsular fracture, the thing you really have to watch out for is something like an intertrochanteric fracture, right? All intertrochanteric means is between the greater and lesser trochanter. Remember, it's that little line in between the greater and lesser trochanter. Intertrochanteric fractures or fractures of the intertrochanteric line are very common. The reason is because that little area just likes to fracture. It just it's built to fracture. This becomes a huge issue because depending on what that patient's doing weight bearing wise, depending on what they're doing in terms of rehab, depending on what they're doing in terms of exercise or just plain movement, the issue is I can turn a non-displaced intertrochanteric fracture into a displaced trochanteric fracture very quickly. And let's think about it, right? If I have that patient doing a bunch of sit the stands or I have them on the leg press or I have them doing a bunch of box steps or whatever it is, there is a risk that that patient could have a displaced intertrochanteric fracture. So I can make the non-displaced turn into a displaced. Now, if there is a displacement or there is a risk to displace, hopefully what's going to happen is that patient's going to go ahead and have an ORIF done. Now with the ORIF, we still have to be cognizant that we do have a foreign body in the body. Have to be redundant. And remember, we also have wounds. Okay, so this is where just because the patient is, you know, quote, a straightforward hip fracture. I always hate when I hear that term. Oh, it's just a hip fracture, no big deal. Well, at, you have to think about how they got down to that hip fracture, right? How did they repair that hip fracture? Well, the first thing they did was put a incision in about, you know, yay long and about yay deep, right? Think about how much tissue, you guys did dissect the cadavers. How was it dissecting that gluteal region? Did it take some time? Yeah. Why? Because there's a ton of tissue back there. So that's the tissue you have to think about that surgeon is excising or lacerating to get down to the bone. So now not only do I have a med screening patient, I have a wound care patient, I have an orthopedic patient, I have, depending on their age, a geriatric patient with pharmacological principles potentially, right? I got a lot of different things going on. So what I have to do is I have to consider all of that. Because remember, postoperatively, my number one goal for the patient is don't get an infection. So when that patient comes in, I need to be aware, and my staff needs to be aware, signs and symptoms of an infection, signs and symptoms of avascular necrosis, signs and symptoms of an allergic reaction to the foreign body or rejection of the foreign body, right? Signs and symptoms that the plate came out or the screws came out. That's a fun one, right? I've seen it. So you have to really be on your game. And the reason I'm belaboring this point so much is because I've seen it happen in the clinic too many times where it looks like a really easy diagnosis. Oh yeah, just straightforward hip, big deal. There's a lot of things going on here, okay? So you really have to be aware. So in terms of numbers, hip fractures, 90% are femoral neck. Reason being is because the femoral neck has less diameter and the femoral neck is typically at, depending if the patient has coxa vera or coxa valga, sometimes it's almost perpendicular to the femoral shaft, right? Coxa vera, Remember, it's less than 125 degrees of femoral neck to shaft angulation. If my patient has coxa vera, they're going to be more likely to have a femoral neck fracture. A lot of times you're going to see this due to osteoporosis. A lot of times, too, and this is where, and we're going to get into this, where a lot of these fractures get missed. Let's think about this. If my patient has osteoporosis, if they have osteoarthritis, they're probably gonna have some other findings on an X-ray, right? So here's what happens. Mrs. McGillicuddy goes in to the doc, hey, my hip hurts. 
Well, what happened? Well, I fell down the stairs. Let's do an x-ray. Well, Mr. McGillicuddy, it looks like you got some hip arthritis. Because the x-ray shows hip arthritis, right? It shows all that sclerosis, shows all of that joint narrowing, all that stuff. Well, really and truly, and what we're going to see with an x-ray is it's very difficult to view a non-displaced hip fracture on a radiograph. It is extremely difficult. So why do I belabor that sort of point? Because that patient's going to go in and they're going to say, well, yeah, you got some hip arthritis, no big deal. Go to rehab. Well, they really actually have a hip fracture. So you are going to have to advocate for the patient that there's something else going on and we need to do some other advanced imaging. As you can see from the last point in the slide, if I suspect a non-displaced hip fracture, that patient's going straight to MRI. We're passing X-ray. We're not even bothering with X-ray. And the reason is, is because non-displaced hip fractures get missed all the time on radiograph because they are extremely hard to see. If it's really bad and it's displaced, yeah, you're going to be able to see it. But a lot of these stress fractures are non-displaced. A lot of the real simple, quote, hairline fractures are non-displaced. They're extremely difficult to see on radiograph. All right, so let's do a little question here. 84-year-old, excuse me, female patient, status post, they fall. Their ER physician suspects a non-displaced hip fracture. Which would be the best imaging modality to view this fracture? Who's voting for radiograph? Who's voting for MRI? Who's voting for let's go on spring break? <laughs> <laughs> All right, yep, MRI it is. So here's why. Okay, so take a look at this. This is a super duper horribly bad neck fracture. And it's still not the clearest thing in the world, is it? Thank goodness I put the big red arrow next to it. So this is what I want you guys to consider. Just because that patient comes to your office and they have been cleared after a hip injury, traumatic or non-traumatic, because think about this, if that patient has osteoporosis, they're at an even more likelihood, an increased likelihood of having a fracture, especially a non-traumatic fracture. So I don't care if that patient got hit by a mule or not, right? I don't care if they fell down a flight of stairs or not. If they look like they have a hip fracture and they're displaying some signs and symptoms of a hip fracture, I want them to go get an MRI because I do not want to take the risk of doing rehab and that non-displaced fracture turning into a displaced fracture. Because at that point in time, you should have known better. Okay, so that's why it's so important. Here's another one. This would be an extracapsular intertrochanteric fracture. This one's a little easier to see. But as you can see, still not the clearest picture because I would argue, you take a look at this. You look at this area up here. Well, what is all that? Is that fracture or not? Because if you look at the ABCs from last semester when we talked about x-rays, that's decreased bone density, isn't it? So is that a fracture or is that not a fracture? Well, if that isn't a fracture, then what's this down here? Is that a fracture or is that not a fracture? All right, take away the big gray arrow and we're not really sure. This is why these hip fractures get missed because a lot of times you're looking at a very unhealthy hip to begin with. Right, that person's 77 years old, history of osteoarthritis, history of osteoporosis, history of some other things. Then what we can see is we can see a very messy radiograph to begin with. Now we're trying to look at a non-displaced hip fracture 
on top of an already messy radiograph. So that's why these get missed, and that's why it's important. Now, I understand the slide got a little messed up. So when we're looking at non-traumatic considerations, these are the big ones, okay? Reason these are the big ones because I'm, I see this all the time in the clinic. If a patient does not have a defined trauma, AKA I'm not sure how it got hurt, or AKA this has been going on for a long time without any mechanism of injury. What I need to do is I need to look at those joint lines, right? I need to look at the femoral acetabular space. I need to look and see and how symmetrical the right side versus the left side is. I need to look at the presence of bone disease and bone tumors, right? Like Casper's disease is gonna be a big one on this. When we start looking at avascular necrosis, the shape of the femoral head is gonna be very important because what we're gonna see as a secondary sign of avascular necrosis is going to be a flattening of the femoral head. And the reason that the femoral head flattens is because it's getting worn off asymmetrically, right? So there's no bone repair, there's no blood supply, and the bone's just kind of getting crushed. And then I obviously want to look at presence of osteophytes and or arthritis. Now, other thing to remember, okay, and, and I want to put this all into context as well. Remember, every patient that comes to you does not have a hip fracture. In fact, when patients come to you with hip pain, nine out of 10 times is hip RC arthritis. And this is where life gets a little easier because the numbers are in my favor to call it hip osteoarthritis. Nine out of 10 is pretty good odds. I'll take those odds. But what happens is that sometimes as you go through your career, you get lulled to sleep a little bit. So if you've seen 40 or 50 straight hip osteoarthritis patients, and then you see that one that's not, chances are you might say it is, just because you've seen so many prior patients. You have to understand and you have to know what the pattern of hip osteoarthritis is, right? I know you guys have covered that in MSK, but asking those questions to establish the pattern is going to be very important because that's going to give you a lot of information. Remember, the patient knows all the answers. The patient is going to tell you everything in that subjective exam. All your objective exam really is going to do is confirm those results. So when we look at degenerative joint disease, AKA osteoarthritis, what we're typically gonna see is asymmetrical joint space narrowing. It happens often, it doesn't happen all the time. In fact, what you may see is you may have joint space narrowing bilaterally, but one's worse than the other, right? I'm sure you guys may have seen this already in the clinic. Who's seen that patient came in and said, yep, well, they're gonna do my right hip this year and my left hip next year. Pretty common scenario. We're going to see sclerosis or sclerotic subchondral bone, right? So remember what sclerosis looks like. It's that big, bright, white edges and those spaces. We're going to see osteophytes. We're going to see all sorts of osteophytes. We may see some cysts or pseudocysts that form. And migration of the femoral head literally means the femoral head starts rising superiorly, right? You'll literally see that femoral head and if you draw a line between the right and left side, you can't draw a straight line between each femoral head. One's higher than the other. This is what hip osteoarthritis typically looks like. Now understand that this is another piece of pattern recognition. If we think about it, Take each one of those findings, and each one of those findings does not necessarily give you a definitive diagnosis. If you guys remember from the PowerPoints last week, I talked about femoral acetabular impingement. I remember I talked about there's a cam and there's a pincer. Well, if I look at that osteophyte, 
that could be a pincer, right? Because what's a pincer? Is it overgrowth of that acetabulum? So that would be one of those signs. But when I have osteophytes and joint space narrowing and sclerosis, now I'm establishing a pattern, right? It's no different than, like I said, playing Texas Hold'em and they're flipping cards, right? With every card, that's another piece of information. It establishes a pattern. It allows me to make a better diagnosis. So when you are looking at your patients and when you're looking at these radiographs, make sure that you're establishing a pattern, okay? Because that pattern is going to give you a better diagnosis, not saying it's 100%, but it's going to be a lot better than saying, well, there's an osteophyte, they have arthritis. Well, it might be something else too. This is what very severe arthritis looks like. Now, this is what I mean when I talk about a very messy radiograph. Imagine trying to diagnose a hip fracture, especially a non-displaced hip fracture with all this other stuff going on, right? We got cysts, we got joint space narrowing, we got osteophytes. I mean, this thing just looks ugly. There's a lot of findings here. This patient may come to you and they may say, yeah, I got hip arthritis. Well, you might got something else too, like a hip fracture. So again, this is what osteoarthritis looks like, but establishing that clinical pattern. Now, when it comes to rheumatoid arthritis, and I know you guys have covered the differences between rheumatoid and osteoarthritis. What we're gonna see, the big one, is symmetric and concentric joint space narrowing. Remember, we talked about osteoarthritis, it is asymmetric joint space narrowing. Rheumatoid, because remember, rheumatoid arthritis is a systemic disease. I'm going to have symmetric joint space narrowing. I'm going to see a fusion. And then I'm going to see a lot of stuff that I saw with osteoarthritis, like axial migration, aka my femoral head moves upward by the femoral head. This is typically what or I'm sorry, rheumatoid arthritis looks like. As you can see, it looks different than osteoarthritis, right? I have some of the same characteristics. Joint space narrowing, however, the joint space narrowing is concentric and symmetrical. I see migration of the femoral head. And actually, if you look at both sides, this is one of those cases where both sides are affected. One's worse than the other. And then obviously you can see a picture where they've had their hip replacement done and what that hip replacement looks like. The stress fractures and stress reactions are a big one. This is one that I won't say gets missed a ton, but you really got to watch out for it because they take a really long time to heal. This is one that and i'm gonna see if i can pull up a youtube video for you guys who haven't done it yet um there's a really interesting ted talk on femoral stress fractures in cadets in the military and there was a huge epidemic of femoral neck stress fractures and slip capital epiphyses in cadets in the military simply because in the early 2000s there were a lot of cadets that came in that had little to no athletic or physical education experience because you think about it, I'll, I'll pull you guys. How many of you guys had gym class in school? All you guys? Did anyone not have gym class in school? Gym class is going away. And for, for a good portion of the population, I can tell you that with folks that I've encountered and when my stepdaughters were in middle school, school district cut funding, gym was the first thing to go. So, the military had a little bit of an issue, not to kind of step on the toes of the TED talk, they had a little bit of an issue where these cadets were coming in, they weren't in the greatest physical shape, and then obviously they went through basic training or boot camp, which is a little more than sitting around drinking coffee, and they were prone to stress fractures, and they had, the military had a huge problem. So 
History of overuse is going to be a big one here. Now, I won't even say history of overuse, but has there been a drastic change in activity? Right? Have I gone from playing Call of Duty 13 hours a day to trying to run a marathon? Brian, I knew you'd like that. Brian, are you still playing Call of Duty 13 hours a day? Uh, not 13 hours. Not 10, 12 and a half? <laughs> I'm kidding. So, but that's, that's my point, is I've gone from relatively being physically inactive to now physically overactive in a couple of days. Big one, what makes it better, what makes it worse? Well, when I lay down and take my, you know, put my feet up, take some weight off of it, I feel fine. As soon as I stand up, oh my gosh. Well, that one should, that one should be a huge sign. What we will see is that with stress fractures, there's going to be a tension side and a compression side. Now, you can see some buckling. That's going to be on the compression side. You may actually see the femoral neck, especially, where there's going to be a part where it pulls away from itself. If we suspect a femoral neck stress fracture and that patient's fitting that clinical prediction, and all the concordian signs and all that great stuff, they go straight to MRI too. Because stress fractures are even harder to look at on radiograph than non-displaced fractures. But MRI is going to be the key to do this. Yes? Would the DEXA scan be better than radiograph? DEXA scan is going to be a really, really good option, um, depending on how much radiation you want to expose them to. So one thing to consider, and I think it's a really good question, is age of the patient, because DEXA scan is going to be a pretty significant dose, and do I want to expose things like reproductive organs to that when I can get the same bang from doing an MRI? So just a little consideration like that, but I think it's a really good point. So as we can see here, I have a tension side and I have a compression side. So if we look at it, that's my tension side, and I can see the bone pulling away, and that's my compression side, because I can see the bone kind of getting crushed in on itself. These are difficult to manage. A lot of times these will get surgically repaired. Because just like with wound care, I need both sides of the insult touching each other in order to have cells grow between them. These are very difficult to manage. Yeah? You said the red was the compression and a purple was the, or is it red, is it red? Res the tension, lose the compression. Oh, no worries, no worries. So this is another example of the compression side of a femoral neck fracture. What you guys can see here is something that almost looks like those Salter-Harris fractures, right? Now remember what the definition of a Salter-Harris fracture is. Salter-Harris is epiphyseal plates or something involving the epiphyseal plates. I don't have an epiphyseal plate here, especially if this is an older patient. So this would not be a Salter-Harris fracture, but what I do have as I kind of have that torsion buckling sort of look, right? So this is going to be, and let's place patterns on this, right? Would you guys expect this to be a weight-bearing mechanism of injury or a non-weight-bearing mechanism of injury? I'm going weight-bearing, right? Because let's think about it. My body weight comes down. The normal force from the ground goes up, compresses the femoral neck. But as you guys can see, there's a lot of lines. There's a lot of stuff to look at here. That's not the easiest picture. This one's even worse. Sorry, stuff's on fire. Yeah. So compression side, as we can see, this one is even tougher to see. And this is what I want you to think about. Remember, this is going to be that patient that comes in. They're 19 years old. They just went to boot camp. 
and their hip really hurts. And they do an x-ray. What's the x-ray show without those fun little lines in there? A whole lot of nothing. So yeah, go ahead and go see PT, see what they got to say. And this is that patient that comes in and they can't bear any weight and they can't do a straight leg raise and they can't do all this other stuff. This patient probably needs an MRI because that's going to give a more definitive picture than what they have here. And I will tell you that in certain cases, you will have to advocate for that patient. This is another femoral neck stress fracture. You guys all can see it, right? There it is. Let me take, let me take a little circle away. Where'd it go? There it is, right? So, I mean, exactly, right? Like, you take that circle away, that looks like a pretty good hip to me, doesn't it? Oh, so that's looking pretty solid. If I'm looking at x-rays at 70 every hour, less than a minute per x-ray, is that going to get missed? Good chance, real good chance. Now, someone was nice enough to put that little red circle in there for us, right? But this is why I believe this point so much, because it, that radiograph doesn't show me a ton of evidence for a femoral neck stress fracture. That person is going to end up at rehab, end up somewhere else, and now we've got a problem because if that's not treated and treated appropriately, it will become a displaced neck fracture. It will become an emergent event for that person. Because your hand up or you're just, okay, all right. No, you're good. Now, to your point, this is the DEXA scan. DEXA scan, definitely going to show me a lot. I, have, I get a very, very good picture here. I have very good evidence. The detracting side from doing a DEXA scan is going to be the amount of radiation that patient is exposed to. The other thing, and this is also what I need to think about, is in an emergent situation, how long does the DEXA scan take? They're in there for about an hour, hour and a half. Right? It takes a long time. My last job during undergrad, I worked for a bone metabolism study, and all of our research subjects got a DEXA scan. And they were in there for a long time. So DEXA scan is going to give you a lot of good information, but no radiation exposure. MRI is going to take the same amount of time, no radiation exposure, and I have as clear a picture as I need. All right, so there's a femoral neck stress fracture. On x-ray, not seeing a whole lot. Good. I got, we got the circle. There it is on MRI. Okay, so I can get a little better picture here. And there it is on a T1 MRI. So T2's in the middle, T1's on the side. And I can see a really nice area of whitening or darkening, depending on what my picture is. So based on that MRI evidence, I can make a much better diagnosis. I can make a much more definitive diagnosis. All right, let's go ahead. Let's take five, and then let's talk about vascular necrosis. Make you guys the rest of class standing. Jeez. God. So, would you probably like choose a DEXA scan or something like that if they had like a pacemaker and you were going in MRI? Exactly. Exactly. On the last slide, you said T1 was all the way to the right. Yeah, even though the CSF was really bright. What did you say? Or is that like blood? That's a T. That is a T1. Right. So I'll, I'll make it right. That's T1 and that's T2. Okay. I'll make I'll make the correction. Cool. Thank you. Yep. Uh, <laughs> 
Yeah, T one's in the middle, T two's on the side. I got them mixed up.
through this and get rolling. Okay, so I am going to make a correction on the femoral neck stress fractures. On the left-hand side, we have an x-ray. On the middle, we have a T1 MRI. And on the right side, we have a T2 MRI. So moving on from there, avascular necrosis. Literally, what avascular necrosis is going to be, it's going to be an external vessel compression. Now, what I will tell you is this more than likely is going to happen from a trauma. However, I've seen it happen with infections, and unfortunately, I've seen it happen with steroid use, both anabolic steroid use and corticosteroid use. Watch out for this one, especially with the corticosteroids, because a lot of folks are going to have corticosteroid injections done in their hip because it makes the hip feel really good, right? It takes out all the inflammation and does it locally. Remember back to last semester when we kind of talked about elbows and stress fractures, I had a patient who had an overabundance of corticosteroid injections and that caused the bone to deteriorate. So watch out for things like that. Watch out for, unfortunately, in this day and age, folks that are using anabolic steroids as well. In fact, I just had a talk with a, one of my colleagues at the clinic yesterday. His son was seriously considering starting to use antibiotic steroids. So they're out there. Think about thromboembolytic processes. Okay, what do I mean by that? I mean alcoholism. This is a big one because a lot of times, think about what alcoholism can cause. It can cause cirrhosis of the liver. It can cause a lot of different metabolic processes to happen, which are all going to affect how that person heals. Their healing rate could be defined as avascular necrosis because they're simply not getting the nutrients that are needed to repair a certain part of the body. Therefore, the part of the body starts to die. That's where the necrosis part comes in. Diabetes is a big one. Okay, you guys know what diabetes does to the body. What I want you to think about is just because that person has a hip fracture, hip osteoarthritis, whatever it is, if I have that diagnosis of diabetes, that's going to add a very large, very serious confounding variable because my healing rate is going to be a lot different. Same thing with sickle cell disease. If my patient has a diagnosis of sickle cell, they're going to take a lot longer to heal, right? Because what is sickle cell disease? I'm sorry? And it is a blood disorder. What type of blood disorder? Red blood cells, right? What is the job of the red blood cell? Carry oxygen, right? So if 15 or 20% of my red blood cells are not able to carry oxygen, what's that going to do to my healing rate? Well, actually, healing rate goes up, right? Because the time goes up. But it takes me a lot longer to heal. And I actually have a greater likelihood of having something like avascular necrosis because what I want you to think about is that hip is already under a ton of weight bearing. It's already under a ton of stress. So I'm grinding, I'm shearing that hip, and I don't have the proper blood flow, aka the proper oxygen, healing that tissue the way it should. That means that over time, I have more tissue that is being destroyed than is being repaired. Okay, and that's why it takes so long sometimes to see these cases. So, like I said, this is why you need to have everybody in your office aware of what's going on. I can tell you that I've been in clinics where the PT does the eval and PTAs or techs are doing a lot of stuff after that, whether or not it's under supervision or not. So three, four weeks in the treatment plan, hey, this patient's not getting better. This patient's getting worse because that's what they're going to do. They're going to steadily decline. You need to be made aware of that because ultimately you're going to be the responsible party for this. So you need to watch patterns. And I will tell you that in some states, it's actually kind of nice because you have to co-sign all the notes. It gives you the opportunity to read the notes. This is not one of those states. 
you don't have the cosine nodes in North Carolina. So that becomes a little bit of an issue because unless you're actively looking and seeking out those charts, you won't see it. So you're going to have to rely on a lot of communication from your colleagues. MRI, like I said, that's going to be the biggest, most sensitive, most specific. If I suspect avascular necrosis, they're going straight to MRI. Now, when it comes to the term radiographic sequelae, all that really means are those secondary signs and symptoms, right? So any one of those symptoms is not going to tell me I have a avascular necrosis, but several of those establishes a pattern. So all a crescent sign is, is a little area of darkening right around the femoral head in the shape of a crescent. And the reason it's happening is because just under that periosteum, just in that little bit of subchondral bone, that bone is starting to die. What we will see is we will see that tissue over time start to collapse because there's nothing left. So the femoral head starts to look flat. So you actually see femoral head over three quarters, two thirds of the surface looks fine and all of a sudden it just levels off and it's flat. What that means is that the femoral head does not have the appropriate bone structure to hold itself up. And weight and shear forces are crushing that femoral head. That is a bad sign. You will also see something called secondary osteoarthritis. You'll see this huge sclerotic reaction. And this is where a lot of times the avascular necrosis gets missed because you see sclerosis. Well, hey, sclerosis, osteoarthritis, no big deal. What you have to ask yourself is, why am I seeing that? Why am I seeing that finding? So if I see a lot of associated signs and symptoms, if I see that patient has a clinical pattern, a clinical presentation of avascular necrosis, I need to advocate for my patient. I, I will tell you that I had a situation, my last full-time clinic job. Yes? How, besides the not putting a whole lot of weight and hardly walking, how do you tell avascular necrosis? Kind of, from my point of view, if you overwork, they have no way in overworking them, and they are having issues walking, I feel like that's hard to figure out that tell the difference between this and necrosis or like this school will work. That makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. So that's where you have to ask the patient, what does it feel like? Right? So if you overwork a patient, what sort of signs and symptoms would you expect them? Yeah, I'm sore. Then you ask a follow-up question. Where are you sore? Well, if they point glute max, it's probably soreness, or glute mead, it's probably soreness, right? Also, there's a lot of times where you can't really use a point and shoot one time diagnosis. Well, how do you feel today? Oh man, I feel a little worse. Well, you got any best from process. I mean, that's a big yeah. bit of a jump, right? Now, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating an example a little bit. But if I see that patient and they're steadily declining, my first question is, why are you still seeing them, right? Second question is, okay, what else is going on? So I will tell you that a lot of the signs and symptoms in eval are going to help you, okay? Weight bearing and how they bear weight is going to be a big one, right? So I'll give you an example. This is where I was going. So in my last clinic job, I had this patient come in. Guy was 55, 60 years old, worked at a factory that I was a PT at. And he literally was dragging his leg behind him during the gait cycle, but dragging his leg in a very specific fashion. So what's the open pack position for the head? 3033, right? Okay. So if I want to put my hip in the open pack position, what am I going to do? I just put myself in 3033, or 3033-ish. So this is how I got this guy came in. Loading asymmetrical side, contralateral side, unloading this side, 
puts the hip in external rotation, flexion, and abduction. Then, when he walks in, this is how he walks in. Okay, I know I'm right now. So he walks in, I do an evaluation on him. Not really point tender, like I palpated all over the place, wasn't really point tender, right? He was unable because of pain to do a straight leg raise. Okay, so you guys have talked about an MSK, the straight leg raise sign, right? Now, let me ask you this. During the first 30 degrees of hip flexion, what direction is iliopsoas contracting? It should be contracting to its origin, right? Right, okay. Now, here's what I want you to think about. Think back to cadaver lab. How close does that iliopsoas sit in reference to the femur? It sits on right on top of it, doesn't it? So here's what happens. During the first 30 degrees of hip flexion, iliopsoas is pulling towards its origin. You guys remember what the origin of iliopsoas is? And the chill filled the room. The anterior surface of the transverse processes of T12 through L5. Mm. So I guess this is the point in time where I'm going to announce the next anatomy trivia night. So think about that. Okay, so my origin is at the anterior surface of the transverse processes of T12 to L5. What's the insertion of iliopsoas? Lesser trochanter of the femur, right? Okay. When I contract a muscle, I'm going to bring my insertion closer to my origin. So the first 30 degrees, I'm creating this. Well, if that patient's supine, am I not creating compression? Right. So that was one of the big signs, was he was not able to do a straight leg raise at zero degrees. However, when I brought his leg up to 45 degrees and asked him to do a straight leg raise, he was okay doing it. Why? Because at that point in time, he was no longer creating a compressive force at the femoral tabular joint. He was creating flexion. Make sense? So here's what happened. I see this guy, he can't walk, he can't bear any weight on his leg, and can't do a straight leg raise. So I contacted the referring provider and said, can we get this patient an MRI? I think there's something very going very wrong in his hip. Now notice what I did not say. I did not say, hey, this patient has avascular necrosis. Because at that point in time, I wasn't sure. At that point in time, I thought he had a stress fracture. Because the signs and symptoms for avascular necrosis and the signs and symptoms for a stress fracture almost overlap. Right? So I wasn't sure. The referring provider came back and said, this guy has arthritis. You need to do some ultrasound on him. Anyone see any problems with that? What's ultrasound contraindicated for? Fractures, stress fractures, things like that. I thought the guy had a stress fracture. So I'm not kidding when I say this thing got blown up big. My boss, her boss, got pulled into it. We had this huge, big, whole meeting about why I refused to do an ultrasound. Okay. Yeah, I'm talking like, and I had to stand up and I had to defend myself. And I said, here are his signs and symptoms. I had to research to back it up that he meets the clinical practice pattern of either a stress fracture or a vascular necrosis. And I requested imaging to screen for and make sure he's safe to do rehab. The um, referring provider relented and said, okay, let's go ahead and let's do an MRI. But looked at me and said, that MRI comes back clean, you better do rehab on it. I was like, that's fine. So two weeks later, um, yeah, he has avascular necrosis. He's going to go in for hip replacement. 
And I, I mean, I just said, I, I said, I really thank you for doing what was best for the patient, which is a little bit of a jab, but, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, I, I, I take more I can get them. But that's my point, right? I didn't know. I didn't know. And you're, this oftentimes you're not going to know because you've got to use your PT tools. I didn't know that patient had a vascular necrosis. I didn't know that patient had a fer femoral neck fracture. All I knew was what in the world am I going to do with him if he can't bear weight and can't do a straight leg raise, right? What am I going to do? What am I going to work on? So I, using clinical judgment and the evidence said, let's get this patient an image. Now, there have been plenty of times where I've gotten the image, they come back and they're fine. All right, let's roll. Let's go. No big deal. But just be very, very aware that this stuff can't happen. So this is what flattening of the femoral head looks like. As you can see, if you look at the most superior medial aspect of the femoral head, see it kind of comes off to a point and slopes down. That's what that flattening looks like. Okay, this is avascular necrosis. That line is just representing the slope. But as you can see, if I'm looking at a bunch of x-rays every hour, oftentimes can get missed. Okay, that's the big point in this. Now, there's avascular necrosis, bilateral avascular necrosis on MRI. Shows up a whole lot better. Shows up a lot better. Now, when it comes to leg calves PERS disease, switching gears just a little bit, what we have to understand is that leg calves PERS disease is another pathology that's going to happen around the femoral head. In fact, it is osteonecrosis of the capital femoral epiphysis. Now, think about who has a, 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 geez, growth plates. That was really bad. Right? Think about who has growth plates. Kids. So what we see in the very bottom line here, predominantly, this is a male disease. Can happen female, more than likely male. Average age, six years old. These are kiddos. This is where, when you're working peds, who here wants to work peds? Your peds, one person, that's it? Wow. <laughs> Oh, I'm not, I'm, what, what's that you said? I said I don't know. You don't know? Okay. I was saying, man, we're talking Mitchell. I think she'd be appalled. So six years old, right? This is that kiddo that comes in to a peds clinic because that's where they get referred. Or this kid gets referred into an ortho clinic because that's where they got referred. I worked in an area where we didn't have a peds clinic anywhere close. I used to see patients as young as four and then outpatient ortho sports med clinic. You have to be aware that no matter what the patient's age, they all got body parts, right? So treat them like they have body parts. So typically what we see here is going to be some effusion, demineralization, increased density at the femoral head, the big one is radiolucent areas, almost transparent areas near the epiphysis. That's what leg calves purse disease is going to look like. As you can see, that is an ugly looking hip x-ray. So that's exactly where the epiphyseal plate, I really can't say that word today, epiphyseal plate is and how much destruction has happened there. Now again, in the clinic, I am not going to say this person has LCP or leg calves purse because what's the difference between this and a Salter Harris fracture type five? Not a whole lot, could be either one, right? Clinically, they might present the same. Remember, as a physical therapist, I'm going to use the tools that I have. 
I'm going to make that diagnosis of what I know. Here's what I know. They don't belong in my clinic. Or I need to get them an x-ray. Or I need to get them an MRI to make sure they do belong in my clinic. That's all I know. So big moral story here is, yes, you do have to stay in your lane a little bit. Okay, don't go diagnosing things you don't know about. This is what a skiffy looks like. You guys cover skiffies in MSK a little bit? Awesome. So a skiffy is going to be another epiphyseal plate problem, pathology. What we have to think about is what sort of patient is going to have a skiffy. Most commonly where I have seen this clinically, and this is just my tiny bit of experience, is adolescents. And adolescents that decide they're going to hit the weight room hard. And I've seen this time and time again with adolescents because they're 11, 12 years old, they're showing some promise, and all of a sudden they're throwing up a bunch of weight on the squat rack. So be very, very careful with these because these patients are going to come in, a lot of the same signs and symptoms we've seen, but a lot of times they're going to have a slip capital femoral epiphysis. In fact, I had a student, this was a clinical student when I worked in Florida. He had this, and it was from athletics. So about 11, 12 years old, he was a bigger kid, and he was doing a bunch of sports. You know, he was one of those three-sport athletes and broke the hip slipped it by 16 he had a total hip yeah which was a huge issue because he was still growing so by 22 23 when he was my student yeah he had had this total hip for about seven or eight years he told me all about it so be aware be very aware This is what a labral tear looks like on MRI. This one comes straight out of your textbook that's on access physiotherapy. Typically what we're looking at here, again, this is going to be that patient and think about what your clinical signs and symptoms are and what your clinical tests are to tease out a labral tear, right? What do you guys typically use to tease out a labral tear? Flick them? No? Scour. Scour? What's scour? That sounds fun. Perfect, right? So essentially, what am I doing? Applying shear force, right? I'm applying compression force and shear force. So if that patient has a positive scour test, how sensitive and how specific is that scour test? Not very. Not great. Why not? Like, oh, we know it's intracapsular, but not exactly what it is. Perfect. So then it's not very specific, right? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I'll hit that sensitivity specificity thing time and time again because it tends to catch students, especially when we hit comp exams and PED exams next year. So a scour test is pretty sensitive, isn't it? Because a lot of things can cause it. And the example I use with sensitivity and specificity are car alarms, right? I can set that car alarm to super sensitive and that car alarm is gonna go off all the time, no matter if someone's trying to steal my car or not, right? So if the wind blows, it's gonna go off. Or someone sneezes, it's gonna go off. Or a bird flies by, it's gonna go off. That's a very sensitive, alarm very sensitive test very specific test i can set that car alarm down to the point where only a second year pt student who wears glasses would set the alarm off very specific right so you would not set the alarm off but you would so that's a very very specific test so when looking at label tears what we can see is something very similar to what we saw with labral tears in the shoulder. 
So what we're looking at There's a little tear there. There's a little tear there. That's your capsule. And then anyone recognize that structure? What do you guys think that is? Let's go way back to anatomy. What's that? Come on, let's say it. It's, it's, it's the, the round ligament. Ligamentum teres. This is what an adductor tear looks like on a, this is a very specialized MRI. So what you can see here is that we have a huge area of effusion. So this person has torn an adductor. This is that person that they decide they want to do the splits all in one go. Didn't say they were intending to do it. And this is femoral acetabular impingement. Now, what I will say is when it comes to femoral acetabular impingement, radiographically, there's going to be a lot of changes. Radiographically, there's going to be a lot of differences. Clinically, it's not going to matter that much. What I know is that the, the patient has FAI. I don't necessarily care that much if it's a cam or it's a pincer. That may affect my treatment a little bit if I'm doing like a joint mobilization on them, but it's not going to be that much. That's what a cam impingement looks like. So a cam impingement is going to be an overgrowth of the femur. And that's what a pincer looks like. So the way I remember it is the pincer, it's like the pincers on a crab or something like that, right? So my acetabulum will have an overgrowth. Think back to when we talked about some of the secondary signs of something like avascular necrosis or some of the other stuff happening in arthritis and things like that. I can have an overgrowth of the acetabulum and it not necessarily be something like arthritis. It can be FAI. So there's a bunch of numbers on what, how FAI affects people. FAI is very, very common, and it is common in asymptomatic people, which means that there's a lot of folks out there that have it that don't know they have it. The reason that becomes a problem is because that patient's gonna go in for a radiograph, it's gonna show they have FAI, and oftentimes that becomes the diagnosis. The moral here is don't necessarily just go blindly with that diagnosis. The patient's clinical signs and symptoms have to match the radiograph. All right, let's get up. Let's do another five minute DVT prevention. I should have brought it in a Starbucks or something. <laughs> you can do it.
the rest of this and let's call it a day. All right, so one thing I really want you to start doing is I want you to start studying MRIs pretty intently. Like I said, as we move through the knee, we're going to see a lot of different MRIs. We're going to see a lot of different signs happen, especially we get into the knee, like I said, foot and ankle even more. So what I'm going to ask you to do is take this opportunity to really revisit the application and the principles of MRI because we're going to get through a lot of MRIs here in the next couple of weeks. Tables like this are very, very important. One thing that you're going to have to do is you're going to have to be able to look at some key findings in each MRI, aka what's light and what's dark, and know what type of MRI you're looking at. 
whether or not it's a T1 weighted, T2 weighted. We don't get a ton into proton density and fat sat and things like that and STIRs in this program. But knowing if you're looking at T1 versus T2 is an essential skill for looking at an MRI. So understand what looks bright and what looks dark. Understand where we're going to use T1s and T2s. T2, if I suspect an MSK, remember, at some point, you guys may be able to order images. And depending on what state you guys end up practicing in, you are already able to order images. Okay? T2, if I suspect an MSK injury, I'm going to go with the T2. Your fluid's going to show bright white. T1, if I need to see really, really good anatomic detail, then I need to show or I need to order a T1. So T1, what we see here, left-hand side of the screen, what joint do you guys think that is? I'm going to go elbow. Right? Isn't that the electron? So left hand side of the screen, that's an elbow. Right hand side of the screen, that's a knee. Did I, did I say the wrong? Did I say it backwards? Okay. We're on spring break. It's okay. I officially declared after 1.15 in the afternoon in this course, we're officially on spring break. You can tell your next instructor, I said, we're already on spring break. Just, just to see the look on her face. <laughs> yeah, you, you'll get, yeah, you'll get. Mm. <laughs> yeah. In fact, today we have a pop quiz, right? <laughs> this is what a proton density looks like, okay? So all this is, is just a little different skew on a T1, it, the picture is snapped at a little different portion in that hydrogen cycle. We didn't really cover a ton on how MRIs are made in this course, but just remember that MRI is all based on hydrogen and how the hydrogen spins and how the hydrogen flips in terms of electricity or electron molecules. This is what a proton density fat saturated MRI looks like. Much different picture here. The bone looks very, very dark, but I have a huge contrast between the synovial fluid and the bone, right? So as you can see, I have really little pits that have formed inside my patella. So on the left-hand side of the screen, that's an axial view of the knee. So if I'm suspecting that maybe I have some sort of like necrotic tissue or something happening on the patellar side or the, I should say, the femoral side of the patella, maybe I need to use a proton density fat saturated MRI. This is what a T2 looks like. Now T2, as I can see, I don't see nearly as much detail as I see in a T1 but I can see fluid show up a lot brighter with the T2. This is what a T2 weighted fat saturated looks like. Again, bone's gonna show up very, very dark here. What you see in this picture, especially looking at the right-hand side of the screen, looking at the shoulder, as I see the bursa, right? So if that patient has a inflamed or infected bursa, or maybe a torn bursal sac, I can see that pretty easily. This is what an STIR looks like. We didn't get in a ton into STIRs here. What I can see though, is I can see some very specialized views. One really nice thing about STIRs is I can see something like a brachial plexopathy or I can see a lesion on the brachial plexus, which is what you guys see here, both from a T1 side and the T2 side. And it shows up pretty, pretty bright. So think about it. When that patient comes to me and they have a diagnosis of cervical radiculopathy, right? You don't really tell me much. 
as more of a symptom than a diagnosis. They could have something like this going on. Okay, so I don't want you to discount the fact that there may be something pathological causing that symptom profile to happen. Now looking at MRI versus radiograph. Radiograph, remember, quicker, it's cheaper. In most cases, that is going to be my first line of defense. MRI is not going to expose my patient to any radiation, right? So when you're going through these test questions, that's something that I want to consider. Do I need to expose this patient to radiation? Or am I going to get a better picture with an MRI versus a radiograph? Okay, so think back to the avascular necrosis, think back to femoral neck fractures, all those non-displaced fractures. I'm going straight MRI on those because I checked two of those boxes. I get a better picture and no radiation. Obviously, there's going to be negatives to both these as well. This is where a little bit of clinical judgment comes in. Radiograph, it is exposing that patient to radiation. As we saw, if it's a lumbar oblique radiograph, it's like a whole bunch of x-rays. If it's a CT, it's a whole bunch of x-rays, it's a whole bunch of radiation. The other thing I need to consider is if I need to move my patient or not, right? If I have a really unstable neck fracture, I may want to put them in a CT because I, I can stabilize their head, or I can put them in MRI because I can stabilize their head. If I have an unstable neck fracture, do you want to flip that patient eight ways from Sunday? No, probably not. Obviously, there's negatives of MRI. It is expensive. If you have a loose piece of metal in your body, aka if I have a pacemaker or I had some metal in my eye or whatever, please do not put them in MRI because you will find out what that pacemaker looks like in a heartbeat. No pun intended. All right, it's coming out. So I'll tell you what, since it's already spring break for seven minutes, eight minutes now, let's go ahead and let's cut it here. Everybody have a very good break. I'll see everyone after break. No problem.